Last two weeks, uh, we started a series talking about revelation. And um, even though I wasn't here last week, I remember logging in and I remember my wife doing a recap of some of the things that we had talked about before she went on to deliver a message for last week. And uh, I was blessed by, by the message. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much. And so this week we want to continue and we want to look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you open it quickly to John chapter 12. I will start from verse 20. John chapter 12, verse 20. The Bible says that now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Verse 21. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Verse 22. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. The question that they asked him was that, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Now, depending on the translation that you use, some of them will say we wish to meet Jesus. And so by the grace of God today, I will talk to you on the title, We Want to See Jesus. That will be the title of the message today. I'm believing God that you, each and every one of us, will meet him in a different light in Jesus' name. The setting of this passage is very simple. Jesus had gone to Jerusalem for the feast, and his disciples were with him, and the feast was about over now. And as the feast is over, certain of the Greeks, according to the scriptures, came to them. It means that when they came, They just didn't come for the feast, but they came for something else. It is one thing for everybody to come for a church service. It's another thing for somebody to come with a specific motive in mind. And so when these ones knew that with the crowd here, you need an insider to get to Jesus, so they went to Philip. Why they chose Philip, I'm not sure. But history has it that Philip and them probably came from around the same area, and so they could identify with him. And so they tell Philip and say, Sir, interesting, is one of the few passages in scripture where they use the word sir. They said, Sir, we want to meet your master. And the Bible says that Philip, being who he is, Philip, for those of you that may not know him very well, Philip likes to identify problems. But Philip has never been known to have solution to any problem in scripture. And so Philip identifies this problem and goes to the man that always has a solution, which is Andrew. Don't forget it was Andrew, it was Philip that said, there are 5,000 people, it will take a year's wait to feed them. And he left it like that. It was Andrew that said, no problem. Even I see a boy here with bread and fish. So Andrew again now says, No problem, Philip, come with me. Let's take them to the master. Now, when you understand that, then you ask yourself, what exactly is the context of to see here? Because if all they wanted was to see, I'm sure from where they were, they could see him. Because everybody that went to the temple, it was good enough that you'd be able to see him. Remember? And I'll talk about that here. If you just wanted to see somebody by eyeballing them, it was so easy that ordinarily being around the same place with him, you will have been able to eyeball him. And so I'm going to give you about three or four definitions of the word to see so that you can understand where where we are coming from. The first one there means literally to set your eyes on. You just want to set your eyes on somebody. If you look in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 19, The Bible says that Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was going to be passing. And because he was a man of short stature, he climbed a tree that he may see, just to eyeball him. 
The second one is a figurative one. It means to come to see with a benefit. I remember in those days, and I'm sure people still do it, when something happens, especially if your wife has a child or something, people come to see you. Now, when they come, at least by, by tradition, they don't come empty-handed. If they don't want to give you something, they give your child something. And so the sin there has a benefit. They will say they came to what? See you. Number three, to see also can mean to perceive with the mind. Remember in Jeremiah chapter one, the Lord was telling Jeremiah, he said, see, I have this day. It means to behold, to perceive. And then God asked him again, he said, what do you see? There was really nothing in front of him. And so he looked with the eyes of his heart and said, ah, I see this. And then he said, what do you see again? So we've, de we've defined three different ways that you can see. Number four, simply means to be acquainted with. It means to meet, to discuss. It means to be in the company of. And it means to experience that person. Now, this fourth one is the reason why they came. Because they did not come just to eyeball him. Everybody had eyeballed him from afar. They did not come because they had some special gift to give to him. They did also did not come because they wanted to see him with the eyes of their heart. They came to experience what it is like to meet him. And so when they therefore needed that, knew that they needed audience, then they went to him. Then they went to Philip. And Philip then told Andrew that told Jesus. The Bible says in, first, in, in John chapter 3, it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life and who does not shall not see life. Meaning that that person will not experience eternal life. John chapter 8, the Bible says, Most assuredly I say unto you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Meaning that he will never see, experience eternal death. And of course, if you want to, another part of the story there, in that same Luke chapter 19, after Zacchaeus climbed the tree and saw with his eyes, the Bible says that when Jesus himself saw him, he said, come down, I will be your guest today. And what did he do? He experienced the presence of God. And in experiencing the presence of God, you will notice two quick things that he did. I was trying to do the mathematics, and, but there are too many variables for those of you that do math. Because he said, first of all, I give half of my goods to the poor. So I tried to calculate that if he had 10 million, that 10 million immediately became 5 million. And then he now said, after that, everyone I've ever cheated in my lifetime, I returned unto them fourfold. Meaning that if he cheated you 100,000, he gave you 400,000. Praise the Lord. By the time I did the mathematics, I realized that Zacchaeus had truly repented. He did not care what happened to the things that he had gotten by ill means. All he was ready to do now was to do the right thing. And that is the kind of experience that people have when they're in the presence of the master. There's another good story in the book of First Kings that illustrates the, what to see. The queen of Sheba said, I have heard all about you. He said, but I didn't believe them. He said, I came to see. And the Bible says that every question that she asked Solomon, Solomon answered. And the Bible says that when she now saw the way everything was organized, the Bible said there was no more spirit left in her. So you understand that the word to see here means to experience the presence of somebody. Now, one example I can give you is if you remember the story of when Jesus went to visit Mary and Martha. Jesus got there. And one of them was busy in the kitchen. Jesus did not say that what she was doing was bad. All he said was that what the other one was doing was better. 
meaning that there is something that stays with you forever when the master visits you. My prayer is that the master will visit you today. Yeah. And that as he comes, he will deliver that which you need in the name of Jesus Christ. Just for us to understand, I'm going to talk to you briefly about what is there to see in Jesus. You know, when you say, I want to see somebody, what I said, exactly are you expecting to see? What exactly are you expecting to experience? What exactly do you want to know? What exactly do you want him to tell you? What is there to see? Number one, when you come to see Jesus, there are things that you will expect, there are things that you will not expect. Let me tell you the truth. Just like when you come in the presence of some mighty men, so to say, there are things that you won't even know that, you, that they do. Praise the Lord. And so, whenever this kind of meeting occurs, you can be sure that there will be surprises. Number one, what's the first thing that they will expect to see? When you are with Jesus, you cannot but see God's presence. After all, the Bible calls his name what? Emmanuel. And Jesus himself said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Meaning that when you see him, now we are not talking about physical resemblance. We are talking about resemblance in the way that he carries himself and he does his things. And that is why Jesus Christ said, I am the Father, the one. He said, whatever the Father has told me to do, I have done. The presence of God alone was good enough for these people to see. The presence of God alone was good enough to convict the sinner. The presence of God alone was good enough for the one that is sickly to say that be cheerful is calling you because you can never leave his presence the way you came. It is not recorded in scripture that there was anybody that came and went back with regret. It is not recorded in scripture that there was anybody that came with a problem that Jesus didn't have a solution for. And so, it means when you see him and he can sit and take time for you, you can be sure that your problems are over. You can be sure that there is a wisdom, there is a word of wisdom for what you are going through. You can be sure there is a pardon for the sin that you have been carrying around. After all, he himself said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will do what? I will give you rest. Number two. Number two, when you go to Jesus, you will expect somebody like that <laughs> to have a lot of bodyguards, so to say. But then you'll be surprised that Jesus was very accessible. Anybody could come to him. The reason that there are so many stories in scripture that will let you know that Jesus was very accessible. If Jesus was not accessible, the woman with the issue of blood couldn't have touched him because she would have had to go through layers of protocol. But there was no protocol. I don't know, maybe protocols were not trained in those days. But for some reason, there were no protocols. Jesus proved to them that as the Father is accessible, I am accessible. Jesus proved to them that that passage that says, why you yet speak, I answer. They found it in him. No wonder why, why Zacchaeus was climbing the tree and he was still speaking, if only I can see him. Jesus was answering and said, come down, I'm coming to your house. So accessibility is one thing that when you come to Jesus, you realize it's accessible to the young, it's accessible to the old, it's accessible to everybody. All you need to do is to come. As far as you come, is there for you. John chapter 6, verse 37, it says, whoever comes to me, I will not drive them away. Meaning that as far as you came, you will not be driven away. Number three, 
Number three, what did they see in Jesus? They saw a man that loved the people. They saw a man that loved the people. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I like to allow my mind to run wild. In these passages, I have never believed that all the miracles that Jesus Christ did were the ones that were recorded. After all, John said that of all, of all the things that Jesus ever did, that if they were to record them, he said that even all the books would not contain it. Remember? So I imagine Jesus is at this feast. They've already heard or seen one or two things about him. So what do you think is happening? There are people waiting. There are people waiting that if only when he's passing by here, he can smile to me. If only there's a child waiting. He remembers the story of the other children. They told him that when he came to our city, he put us on his lap. And then he prayed for us. So there are children waiting. Even as, even as an ordinary pastor, sometimes when I'm coming out of my office, there are children waiting. And what do you do? You give them high five. You shake them. Because if you don't do that, their expectation for that day has not been fulfilled. And so Jesus, knowing fully well all the people that are waiting, he still had time for these Greeks. Meaning that Jesus has time for everybody. He has time for you. He has time for you. He has time for you. He has time for everybody. And I realized that Jesus is never in a hurry. He takes his time to solve one problem. The Bible says that when he was going, when Jairus came to him and said, my daughter is nearly dead. He said, don't worry, your daughter will not die. Let us go. As they were going, the Bible says somebody came and touched him. It sounds very insensitive that you are going to somebody's house that the child is dying, and then you say, who touched me? It sounds very insensitive that don't you know this is an emergency? Don't you know that that child will die before you get there? Don't you know that this parent is in pain? He says, who touched me? I can imagine Jared standing like that and saying, what is this with this man? <laughs> and I can imagine, God forbid, if Jairus' wife was there, she would have been rolling on the floor and say, ah, my owner has finished. But the master stood. He said, somebody touched me. Jairus would have thought, let us go. Nobody touched you. Can't you see everybody? And then after, they came and told Jairus and said, Stop, don't bother the man again. The boy is dead. The, the child is dead. Remember? And what did he say? He said, don't worry about that. No, I like that kind of person. Not, not in a hurry. Because he created time. Are you getting it? And so if he created time, I cannot time in on the time that he created. So what do you do? He says, let us go. He has time for everyone. Brother, your time will come. Amen. It doesn't matter now. It may seem as if he's answering other people. You remember that song? While on others, you are calling. Uh, don't pass me by. Is it not because you are waiting for your turn? Yes, it's the song. But these days, it looks like everybody wants to be number one. Everybody wants to be the first one to be answered. In fact, sometimes, let me tell you the truth, sometimes it is better for God to answer others before you. If they make mistakes, you will have seen it. It's a selfish way to do it. But if they make mistake, you will have seen it. <laughs> and then you will know what to avoid. I keep telling God, thank God I didn't come like Peter. All today, all of us can laugh. We can say Peter talks before he thinks. It's because he came first. How many of us, even after reading about Peter, still talk before we think? Are we together? So, number one, it, it, number one, what did they notice? The presence of God. Number two. Number three. Number four. What did they come to see? They came to see a man of all possibilities. A man that with him, all things were possible. 
You don't need to go far to know that it's not easy to feed 5,000 people. You don't need to go far to know that it is not easy to raise people from the dead. In fact, this is John chapter 12. If you remember the story in John chapter 11, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Wouldn't you be curious? Some of you do as if you don't know what I'm talking about. When people go for programs, I see the way people behave. They want to shake the man of God. They want to smile to the man of God. That did not start with your generation. It started before your generation. The only thing is that these ones, they had something specific in mind. So with him, all things were possible. You know, I was reading it and I realized God on three, two or three occasions by himself opened the heavens and spoke. Matthew chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, the Bible says that Jesus was coming out of the water. He was praying. Another time we'll talk about that. He was praying. And the Bible says that the heavens opened. And a voice came down from heaven. And the Bible says with that voice came a dove. And the voice was very distinct. He said, this is my beloved son. In what? Whom I am well pleased. Do you know that up to that, Jesus had not even performed any miracle. But, Jesus, but God was already pleased with him. You know why? Because Jesus had character. God was already pleased with his character. The last time we heard about him was in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, verse 52. That was the last time we heard about Jesus. The Bible says he stayed behind, in, he stayed behind and then he now came with his parents, and then they told him at the age of 12, don't you know that what you did has put us in some, in some anxiety? And the Bible says, and from that day, he was subject to them. He listened to them. And then the Bible now says he now grew in wisdom. You can read it. He now grew in what? In wisdom. And when he grew in wisdom, he grew in favor, both with God and with men. But then character matters. Forget power. Character matters. When God spoke the first time, there was no miracle on the table. Go back and read it. At least up until then, there was no miracle on the table. Jesus was passing at that time from a son to a servant. He was passing at that time. The baton was being given to him from heaven. That yes, you are a son, but now you are becoming a prophet. Everything you say from now will come to pass. He had not even made one prophecy yet. God was pleased with it. Brethren, if only you live your life to please God. I keep telling people, God is my witness. If you please God, you don't need to pray to go to heaven. You will automatically be there. After all, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God for they that come. When a man's life pleases the Lord, you don't even need to pray about your enemies. <laughs> God himself will make your enemies. Those scriptures stand. May I tell you, if you are still praying about some things, Go back and check. Am I pleasing God? The heavens opened for a second time. The first time, many people were there. The second time, only three people were there. The Bible says that the heavens opened again. And when the heavens opened this time around, the Bible did not record that the Holy Spirit was there. The Bible did not record that the angels were there. The only thing the Bible records is that this is my beloved son. He added something else. He said, better hear him. He's talking in Matthew chapter 17 now. He said, you hear him. Why? 
Because everything he has said up until now will come to pass. And whatever he says now before he dies will also come to pass. Those are things that I need to understand. So, the presence of Jesus brings you into the presence of possibilities. Are we still together? Jesus in Luke chapter 12, after these Gentiles came to him, he prayed. He said, Father, glorify your name. Not my name, your name. And the Bible says, and the Bible says he turned that again. <laughs> For the third time, he turned that. And some of them said, ah, maybe it is angels, maybe it is this. And all he said was that I have glorified my name and I will glorify it again. Brethren, God can glorify himself in your life. And when he does that, men will be attracted unto you. Number what? Number five. Number five. When, God, when you are in the presence of Jesus Christ, you recognize that you are in the presence of a man of connections. <laughs> A man of what? Connections. First of all, Jesus is connected to God. There's no other connection you want more than that. When you need a reference, and the only person that can write your reference is God. That's connection. But then Jesus was also connected. And this connection we knew when he went to the Mount of Transfiguration. The Bible says that when they looked suddenly they saw Moses. They saw Elijah. And what is interesting is that the Bible says that they were talking. I'm still praying. What were they saying? What were they saying? Don't forget that Jesus Christ was about to go to the cross. So I can imagine Elijah telling him that don't worry, you will do well. And Elijah will say, you remember you fasted 40 days, I fasted 40 days. If I could do it, if I could come true, you will come true. I can imagine Moses answering and said, are you worried about Peter, James, and John? Don't worry. I was worried about Joshua too. That I didn't ever think Joshua could do it. It took God himself to encourage him. I can imagine what they are saying. I like to be, I like to eavesdrop on that kind of conversation. I can imagine what they are saying. Somebody's about to go to uh, the cross. And I can imagine Moses saying, look, look, look. Your death is going to be mysterious. Mine was too. And Elijah is going to say the same. That when I left this earth till today, people are still looking for me. <laughs> that connection, brethren, is connected to the past. No wonder he told them. He said, look, before, Jesus Christ, before Abraham was, I am. I am connected to the past. No wonder the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. He said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When you look around, as you are coming from the Mount of Transfiguration, he had other connections. Peter was there. James was there. So he had the connection both to the future and to the past. No wonder he stands in the center. Even time is recorded in his name. 2023 AD. Because he has the connections. I don't know about you, but there are some people when you go to them, you don't need to talk for them to say, I know somebody there, I can introduce you. One introduction can solve all your problems. How much more the one that has connection in heaven, he has connection on earth. Let me see if I can give you one more because of time, and then we'll close. Let me quickly talk about what do you lose when you see him? Because the truth of the matter is that you lose something. And this is the problem part. A lot, of, a lot of us want to see him, but we don't want to lose anything. But you lose something. 
whenever you come into the presence of somebody like Jesus Christ, something is supposed to drop from you while you pick up something else. There are two basic things that you lose when you come to him. Number one, you lose sin. What do you lose? And that is why I'm always surprised when people say, ah, I have been with Jesus, but their life is full of sin. Then you need to ask, what Jesus have you been with? After all, the Bible talks about all sorts of people that were pretending to be Jesus in those days. In fact, when I was young, some of you may remember if you, if, I mean, some of you, that, 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 there used to be a Jesus of one place in a place in Lagos, in Nigeria. And that Jesus there, I never saw the man face to face also that, you know, in those days they believed that even just seeing the man like this, that your spirit is gone. So, I never saw him. But after he died, exactly according to scripture, everything faded away. You can call yourself Jesus of Mountain or whatever you like. There's only one Jesus, and that's the Jesus of Nazareth. Zacchaeus lost something. He lost the wealth that he had ill-gotten. I'm only surprised. People want to come to Jesus, but they want to keep living a life of sin. I'm only surprised. People want to come to Jesus, but they want to continue to lie. I'm only surprised. People want to come to him, but they, want to, they don't want to lose anything. And he himself said, go and sin no more. It is a shame for us to be in the presence of Jesus Christ and not lose something. What's the second thing that people lose when they come to him? They lose darkness. They lose what? Darkness. But the Bible says men loved darkness. Do you know that I realized that people may not say it with their mouth, but in reality, but in reality people love darkness. You don't hear Christians magnifying the works of light. What do they magnify? The works of darkness. The Bible says, greater is he that is in me. Right? And then you hear Christians saying that they are chasing me. Who is chasing you? Who is chasing you? And if they are chasing you, you don't look tired. <laughs> If they are really chasing you, you will look tired. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And let me tell you the truth. If they are chasing you, if people want to catch you, does it take long to catch you? Don't you sleep? Yeah. The time that you are sleeping, won't they catch you? Yeah. Men love darkness. Brethren, be ready to walk away from yeah. darkness. Those two things. Walk away from every works of darkness. Every works that doesn't look the way Christ will do it. Walk away from it. Walk away from every form of secrecy. Those things that you do that you don't want anybody to hear because you know that it is not right. That business dealing that when you are doing it, you are telling the person that nobody must know. Darkness. The places you go that you have to look left, right, and left again, you look up. You know you shouldn't go there, but you go. Are we together? Yeah. When you come into the presence of God, brethren, let light shine. Amen. When you come into his presence, let people see you and glorify God. That God has done so much in your life. Long ago I was telling somebody, and by the grace of God we still want to share it. Everybody has a testimony. But the problem is that some of us cannot openly say our testimony. And the reason is because if you say that testimony, there are people around you that will debunk it. 
I told you the story long ago, just briefly I will tell you. When I became a Christian at the age of 12, I went into the dining hall and everybody was scrambling for food. I had eaten enough eggs that day to last me a lifetime. Because when you're in boarding school, you don't eat many eggs. Most of the time when you come, the seniors have eaten all the eggs. And so as I was looking, I saw the egg on the other side and I told this person, please pass me the egg. The person looked at me. I didn't realize somebody had been preaching to the day before. The person looked at me. I just lost weight. My testimony there and then was shattered. Stand on your feet. What did they ask Jesus? What did they ask the disciples? That we may how many of you want to see Jesus today? That we may see Jesus. Brethren, there's a difference between seeing and seeing. When you see somebody with the eyeballs and when you sit with somebody, there are two different things. I want you to lift up your voice. We have just a few minutes to pray. And say, Father, just like Apostle Paul says, that I may see and that I may know you. Apostle Paul prayed that I may know him. I want you to pray that, Lord, that I may see you. That I may know you. That I may be with you. That song says, I want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Just lift up your voice. Talk to him this morning. I want to see you. I want to be with you. I want to meet you afresh. I want a revelation of who you are. I want a revelation of what you can do. I want a revelation of the possibilities around me. Lift up your voice. Say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, that I may see you. Thank you, Father. Continue to pray that prayer even when you get home. Continue to pray that prayer throughout this month of of September. Continue to pray that prayer. And the God that reveals himself to men will reveal himself to you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Before I pray, I just want to remind you, please, remember to give your offering, remember to give your tithe. You are children of light, you are not children of darkness. We don't need to run after you for you to do the right things. Praise the Lord. And so the ushers will pass the, uh, the, what you call, the bowl around. Go to them yourself. Don't let them make you to miss your blessing. Go to them yourself and say, I want to make sure that I give what I brought today. So we are going to pray. Father, we want to thank you this morning for your faithfulness. We thank you, God Almighty, because of who you are. Thank you, Father, for your presence. Thank you, God, for revealing yourself to us. Thank you, Father, because the Bible says in the presence of God there is fullness of joy. And on his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Thank you, Father, for the pleasures that we enjoy. Thank you, Father, for the word that you have brought to us. Father, we give you all the glory. Our Father and our God, we pray today, O God, as many of your children have genuinely asked, Lord, reveal yourself to them. Lord, as many as are seeking, as many as are asking, as many as are knocking on the doors of heaven, I pray today, O Lord, let the doors open unto them. Lord, answer them in the name of Jesus. 
Lord, as they seek, may they find you in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Father and our God, as your children grow this week, I pray that the solution to their problems revealed to them. Amen. I pray, Father, every challenge that they have, I say again, Father, reveal the source and the solution in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, God Almighty, concerning the offering of your children, that you will accept it. I pray, Father, that you will bless it. That, Father, as they sow it, may it germinate and bring forth fruit. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, everyone that has given to your work, I pray that their hands will not wither. I pray, God Almighty, that their pockets will never be dry. I pray that their storehouse will never be consumed by parasites. In the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, God Almighty, that sickness, palmer worm, uh, canker worm, and all the caterpillars, that they will not infiltrate the finances of your children. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, as they go today, I pray, bring men, O oh God, along their way. I say, Father, as they go today, O oh Lord, let them begin to enjoy your connections. Your connections on earth, your connections in heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, as they go today, O oh Lord, introduce them to people that matter. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we give you all the glory and the praise. We pray, God Almighty, that whatever is their heart desire, that God, that you grant it unto them. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Keep your children in the path of light. And Lord, everything that they have left behind, I pray that you will not take them up again. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed.